Hello, my name is Teresa Piacentini and this is Lecture 2, Part 1 in the topic Self, Society and Belonging. And we will be looking at one of sociology's key ideas, moral panics. And moral panics is an excellent example of a sociological concept that has entered everyday language. That is, it is used by the people sociologists study in their research. And we're going to go right into this with an illustrative example of a moral panic that happened in October 2013. A blonde, fair-skinned and blue-eyed girl known as Maria was discovered in a police raid on a Roma settlement on the outskirts of the town of Farsala in central Greece. The police were looking for illegal drugs and unregistered firearms and they came across a little girl, aged about five, who in their words looked different. She was the immediately suspected a traffic child um, and the Roma couple with whom she was living, we can see here, Christos Salis and Eleftheria Dimopoulou, were suspected of either abducting her or buying her in order to make money through benefit claims. And possibly in years to come, forced marriage. Neither of these people were able to produce papers to prove that Maria was their child. As a result, the child, Maria, was taken into care and the couple were jailed on charges of kidnapping and falsifying birth records. So let's kind of look at this a little bit more detail and try to understand what was going on. In this case, um, Child trafficking is really at the heart of the issue. And not only that, it is so-called child stealing by Roma people who have already been judged for centuries to be folk devils, always to be treated with suspicion and fear. Indeed, they feature in fairy stories where pe people would tell their children if they don't behave, they may be taken by gypsies, or if they do misbehave, they were left behind by gypsies. The language the media used to describe Maria's situation was highly emotive. The camp where she was living was described as squalid. The Sun newspaper reported on the 24th of October, and I quote, unkept children played in the street waving sticks at strangers. Old motorbikes and car parts littered the neighbourhood while stray dogs rummaged through piles of rubbish. In another newspaper story from the 22nd of October, a video of Maria dancing for her captors was said to be, quote, disturbing. And most of all, however, what seems to underpin almost all of the reporting on this case was the racist characterization of the situation. The so-called dark-skinned adults contrasted with the so-called fair-skinned child known as the blonde angel. And what's really interesting here is that the telling of this story has been left largely to the media. Children's charities and others have been wary of getting involved and expressing their opinions about the case. But the case was said to offer hope to parents of Ben Needham, who's, who disappeared in Greece in 1991, and Madeleine McCann, who disappeared in Portugal in 2007. So there was a hope for those parents that their children might still be alive again affirming this idea that Roma people steal children. And this is particularly disquieting given that it is known that Roma children have historically experienced being stolen themselves. Um, for example, hundreds of Yenish Roma boys and girls were taken by the authorities in Switzerland between 1926 and 1972. Maria's removal from her parents and the charges brought against them were inevitable, but were by no means the end to the story. And it was difficult at the time to know where the story would end. It seemed that it was very likely that Maria's life and that of all her carers were going to be changed forever by this panic. Whether these changes were positive in the short or long term remains to be seen. And really what we see here then is a perfect example of a contemporary moral panic. Folk Devils on Moral Panics was published in 1971. Um, but the first reference to moral panic was made by Jock Young um, in 1971 
in a book chapter about concern around drug taking in Notting Hill in London. But Stanley Cohen is largely credited for developing the concept. And he says here, societies appear to be subject every now and then to periods of immoral panic. And he identified five key stages of immoral panic. So something or someone is defined as a threat um, to value or to interests. The threat is depicted in an easily recognisable form. There is a rapid build-up of public concern. There is a response from authorities or opinion makers. And the panic recedes or results in societal changes. And if we break this down and look at this in the case of Maria, at the first point, child trafficking was defined as a threat. It's always, um, Roma have always been treated with, treated with suspicion and fear. The threat is depicted in an easily recognisable form by the media. So media representations, we saw the use of emotive language, racialised language. Then there is a rapid build-up of public concern about child trafficking in this instance, drawing on other cases that have captured the imagination. A response from the authorities, well in this case Maria was removed and the charges were brought against her parents, both her birth parents and her adoptive parents. And the panic recedes. So in this case, Maria has been, was taken into an adoption facility, um, but the social prejudices against Roma continue. So what we can see is a process, right? There are different stages to a moral panic. And it's really important when we think about moral panics that we think, how can we identify these different stages? The study of moral panics has continued to hold interest for scholars since Cohen wrote this. Um, and a bit more recently, we have uh, the critics Eric Gooden and, and Nachman Ben Yehuda. They propose attributes to this model, this process that we've just seen. So they said that any moral panic has some key characteristics. First of all, there is concern. There must be awareness that the behaviour of the group or category in question is likely to have a negative impact on society. There is hostility. So there's hostility towards the group in question and this increases, they become folk devils and a clear division forms between them and us. Consensus. Though concern doesn't have to be nationwide, there must be a widespread acceptance that the group in question poses a very real threat to society. And it is important at this stage that the so-called moral entrepreneurs are vocal and the folk devils appear weak and disorganised. Disproportionality. The action taken is disproportionate to the actual threat posed by the accused group. And volatility. Moral panics are highly volatile and tend to disappear as quickly as they appeared due to a waning in public interest or news reports and then changing to another topic. Good and Ben Yehuda are especially interested in the political nature of moral panics. They ask, why do certain social problems become moral panics and not others? Whose values and whose interests are expressed by the moral panic? What is the role of the media and the state in a moral panic? And why do moral panics die out? What is their long-term impact? Good and Ben Yehuda also divide the consequences of moral panics into two. They talk about institutional legacy and normative transformation. So institutional legacy means that the problem is institutionalised by establishing new laws or agencies or professions. And normative transformations means that um, ideas are altered about the acceptability of certain behaviours. So, in so doing, they redraw society's moral boundaries. So, let's move on to how we might analyse moral panics. And there is a method to this practice. In his book, Folk Devils and Moral Panics, Stanley Cohn focused his research on what seemed to be a massive overreaction to a series of seaside skirmishes in the early 1960s in the UK between members of two youth subcultures, mods and rockers. 
And I'd like you to pause here and watch the short clip on the Topic 2 storyboards that provides a nice uh, uh, capture of what happened during these events and is the opportunity to hear from Stan Cohen himself. So rockers um, were a subculture centred on motorcycling. They wore black leather jackets and um, Brother Creeper shoes and they had a particular dress and style. Mods was short for moderns, uh, centred on fashion and music. They wore suits and had a more clean cut look. And in this study onto subculture and society's reaction to subculture, Cohen focused on ways in which the mass media, the public and agents of social control, such as politicians, the courts and the police, interact to create the effect of a moral panic and label certain groups as folk devils. A folk devil is usually a victim of the media used to generalise the behaviour of his or her group. So maybe in the past we've seen this as teenagers, single mothers, benefit claimants, members of ethnic minorities. And a moral panic is precisely that. It is a deviation from mainstream morals, which, if supposedly unchecked, would lead to the breakdown of civil society. The moral panic is fed by prejudiced news stories, TV programmes and the proliferation of rumours on social media. And if you watch this clip, you'll see how he did that. Cohn also begins to touch upon how he conducted his study over the period of 1964 to 1967, and you can find more details in his book towards the end. And this uh, image here we can see is an example of media reporting, Wild Ones uh, beating up Margate. So Margate is the seaside town where the skirmishes took place. A key finding of Stan Cohen's was that the media, by their reaction, keep the panic going and by being there, so being present, amplified the events and the police by going along with it and adding to the drama. So, in fact, the, the media reporting attracted more kids to go. Cohen argues without the drama, the phenomenon didn't exist. There are three different aspects to Cohen's analysis, and I'll go through these. The first, um, so initial incidents at Clacton, one of the places where the skirmishes took place, the role of the media and the reaction of the control cu culture. So looking first of all at um, the initial incidents at Clacton, he describes the impact phase um, as the initial deviation. So the scene setting, the English seaside town, the bank holiday weekend, the ritual that goes with this. What followed then was the inventory phase. So this is where um, the, those exposed to the events, uh, this so-called disaster, take stock. So take an inventory of what has happened. And in this phase, rumours and ambiguous perceptions become the basis of interpreting a situation. Immediate coverage of these initial events reported on the day of terror, with, with reporting soon giving way to theories about motivation and press coverage also extended overseas. The second part of the analysis uh, relates to the role of the media. So the media are particularly important in the early inventory stage, producing processed or coded images of deviants and the deviants. And there are three processes involved, exaggeration and distortion of who did or said what. And there are different elements to this. Firstly, there is over-reporting of events, there's a major distortion through gross exaggeration of the seriousness of events in relation to the numbers present, the damage caused, the effects of any violence. The media use sensational headlines and melodramatic language and deliberately heighten elements of the story considered as news, all of which contributed to the image of the besieged town by the marauding mob. And this isn't limited to language, but also misleading headlines and the repetition of false stories and the publication of reports that received a different perspective from fresh evidence. A second part of this is of this process is prediction, so the dire consequen consequences if there is failure to act. And this, this relates to the inevitability of the event. That is, they would happen again. There is no question of when, but where. And the moral entrepreneurs are engaged in the discussion and they're presented in the media. 
and they talk about what should be done next time. So this is linked to the publication of what Cohen calls non-event stories, news that wasn't news was making the news. And the third part of this process is a symbolization. Um, so words like mod and rocker take on a meaning that symbolize threat. Certain words associated with the events acquire symbolic powers. People would say, we don't want another Clacton here. And it was understood immediately what this referred to. And in this instance, acquiring negative meanings from a neutral st starting point. So even the clothes came to symbolize danger and deviance. A number of key groups are involved beyond the media and they're crucial to the development of a moral panic. Moral entrepreneurs, so I've mentioned them a couple of times, and they will be individuals and groups who campaign to eradicate immoral or threatening behavior. Cohen is very interested in their motivations and tactics. He also talks about right thinking persons. So they would have been at the time, hotel managers, local councillors, hotel and guest house associations, cafe owners, shopkeepers, tradespeople, local residents, religious leaders and headmasters. And it also resulted in the emergence of action groups or so-called moral crusaders who claimed something had to be done. The implication that the formal control culture, so the police and the courts, was not doing enough. And all this was done in the name of a fourth set of agents uh, captured by this idea of public opinion. Cohen conducted individual and group discussions as part of his research and he was interested in how they would both accept basic media images and be sceptical about them. The last part I would like to look at in relation to how Cohen conducted this study is the reaction of the control culture. And Cohen defines societal con control culture as all of those agents responsible for dealing with the consequences of an event. For example, in a disaster, you have police, medical services, welfare organisations. So who, in the name of a collectivity, help to rehabilitate, punish or otherwise manipulate deviance. They are those with institutional power and in a moral panic, they are sensitised to the evidence of widespread deviance. So Cohen seeks to analyse how they adapted to the deviant behaviour and what new forms of control were developed. And he identified three elements to this. Firstly, the gradual diffusion from the area of immediate impact. So this involved local police, then neighbouring police, then regional collaboration, then coordinating activity at Scotland Yard and the Home Office to the involvement of Parliament and legislature. It also included the RAF, the AA, the RAC patrol, who warned police of build-up of motorbike and scooter traffic and transport police on railway lines, turning back so-called troublemakers before they reached their, their destination. A second element here is escalation, not just in numbers of control agents, but in scope and intensity of control culture. There were calls for increasingly punitive measures that emerged from the inventory stage and this serves to legitimate action of control agents so there are increasingly punitive measures that are put into place and justified as proportionate and rational. If a situation is deemed catastrophic and one thinks it will happen again and get worse and probably spread, then excessive and elaborate precautionary measures are justified. And the last element here of the reaction of the control culture is around innovation. New social control measures are suggested, so for example, more powers to the police. In this instance, Cohen witnessed a tightening up and captured in his study the tightening up of existing measures rather than just a more efficient implementation of them. So there were draconian control measures introduced that were seen as innovative. For example, the banning of wearing of mod clothes, the repayment of damage, 9pm curfews, police powers to use roadblocks to intercept troublemakers, the publication of names and addresses of juveniles found guilty, and defining unlawful assembly and introducing laws to prevent hooliganism through unlawful assembly. So that brings us to the end of part one. And in part two, we'll be looking at how the concept has been used and how it has been critically debated.